coming to you today on location in Cleveland, Tennessee. Doc and I are down here for the Feast of Tabernacles, celebrating the Lord's Feast as He told us to do. And uh, uh, we heard a teaching this morning from a young man that we have watched grow up from just a, a little boy. And uh, he's taller than me, stands taller than me now. And I remember when he was just little sitting in his mama's lap. We have Chris Absher. Uh, he's a junior in high school, has an identical twin, so uh, they could switch out and one teach and the other teach and you wouldn't know the difference, but uh, uh, I'm sure you've heard that a lot. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your education, what's going on in your life, Chris. Um, I'm 16 years old and I'm homeschooled, a junior in high school, and I'm loaded down with school right now just trying to get it all done is kind of my day is get up and do school and then take breaks for eating and sleeping. That's basically my life right now. And you're taking some college prep classes as a well? A few. I'm taking a New Testament class and some voice lessons and some other things at the local college here. Lee University here? Lee University. Cleveland, Tennessee. So I'm just going to turn this over to Chris. He did a great teaching on symbols and I want you to hear what he has to say. I, th I think you will learn and get some, you will glean uh, some knowledge and understanding of God's Word. Get ready because what I'm about to tell you will knock your socks off. Jesus was Jewish. I know. Crazy, right? Many times we read the Bible from our Western mindset and we forget that Jesus was indeed Jewish. Many emblems, symbols, and even stories in the Bible seem to relate only to the Jews, but in fact, they are for every believer. So our topic today is biblical symbols. My pastor, Dr. John Looper, taught me much of what you'll hear today as we go on a journey to explore three biblical symbols the prayer shawl, the menorah, and the shofar. So let's dive right in. What is now called a prayer shawl originated with God's instructions to His people in Numbers 15, 37 through 39, which says, quote, You are to make tassels on the corners of your garments. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commands of the Lord that you may obey them, end quote. These tassels were originally attached to the corners of an existing garment, but over the centuries, a separate garment called a talit was designed as a standard place to attach them. The talit is draped over the shoulders or over the head. When it is draped over the head, it becomes a tent or tabernacle in which the individual can meet with God. Similar to the Christian concept of a prayer closet mentioned in Matthew 6.6. 6. However, the prayer shawl's primary purpose is to be a visual reminder of all God's commandments. Hebrew is a very numeric language. Each letter of the Hebrew alphabet represents a number. The Hebrew word for tassel is zitzit. Over the centuries, an intricate pattern of threads, knots, and wrappings have been developed to make the zitzit. When we add up the value of the letters in the word zitzit, the eight threads and the five knots, we get 613, which is the number of commandments in the Old Testament. So when the Jewish people look at the tassel, they are reminded of all 613 commandments. As a Jewish man who never broke any of the 613 commandments, Jesus wore his prayer shawl every day. It reminded him of all God's commandments that he had to follow in order to live a sinless life. In Matthew, the apostle relates a story of a woman with an issue of blood being healed after just touching the hem of Jesus' garment. A more accurate translation of the Greek shows the woman touching not the hem, but the fringe or tassel of his garment, very likely the zitzit of Jesus' prayer shawl. For Christians, the prayer shawl is a great reminder that Jesus was the sinless lamb who kept all 613 commandments and that we should be dependent on touching the hem of his garment daily in order to maintain a right relationship with God. Now that we understand the significance of the prayer shawl, let's continue to the menorah. The original design for the menorah was given by God to Moses in Exodus 25, 31 through 32, which says, quote, Make a lampstand of pure hammered gold. It shall have six branches, 
three branches going out of each side of the center stem." End quote. There are layers and layers of meaning in the design and the use of the menorah. But today, I want to focus in on how the seven branches represent the seven feasts, or times of celebration given by God in Leviticus 23. Each has a natural and historic meaning to the Israelites, and each has a prophetic fulfillment through the life and ministry of Jesus. Not only was Jesus Jewish, but he lived in a largely agrarian society where life revolved around the seasons of planting and harvesting. So it is no surprise that the first four festivals are in the spring and early summer. The first spring festival is Passover. Passover refers to the fact that God passed over the homes of the Jews when he was slaying the firstborn of Egypt during the last of the ten plagues. God passed over these homes because the blood of a sacrificed lamb was painted on the doorposts. According to Revelation 13, 8, Jesus is, quote, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, end quote. Jesus was crucified on Passover, and once his blood is applied to the doorpost of our hearts, our sin is blotted out, and God's judgment can pass over us. The second spring festival is unleavened bread. The Israelites were to make unleavened bread, or bread without yeast, during their exodus from Egypt. Leaven represents sin. Spiritually, Jesus is the unleavened bread because he lived a sinless life. According to Hebrews 4.15, quote, We have a high priest who has been tempted in every respect, just like us, yet without sin, end quote. Jesus lived a sinless life so he could be the once and for all sacrifice for sin. Also in the spring, the first sheaf of the winter grain harvest was presented to God in thanksgiving for his provision. This was called first fruits. Jesus was resurrected on the day of first fruits. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 23, quote, But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to him will be raised when he comes back, end quote. Seven weeks and one day after the day of first fruits was the Feast of Weeks, or in the Greek, Pentecost, meaning 50 days. It was a time to remember the giving of the Ten Commandments. On the day of Pentecost, 50 days after his resurrection, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to those who believed. Now, instead of commandments written on hard stone, we have the Holy Spirit to write them gently on our hearts. Here again are the first four spring festivals. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Through Jesus' death, sinless life, resurrection, and giving of the Holy Spirit, He has ushered in the prophetic fulfillment of the first four festivals. So let's continue to the fall festivals. The first of the three fall festivals is trumpets. Leviticus 23:24 says, quote, "You shall observe a day of solemn rest, a holy convocation proclaimed with the blast of trumpets." End quote. It was a solemn day of soul-searching and repentance. Jesus called his followers to set themselves apart, to turn from their sin and sanctify themselves to God. Jesus is the great trumpet, calling all who believe to a more righteous life. Following the festival of trumpets, is the Day of Atonement. On this day, the high priest would offer a blood sacrifice and enter into the Holy of Holies to ask forgiveness for the sins of the entire nation. Jesus was the perfect blood sacrifice, making atonement for our sins once and for all. Last but not least on God's liturgical calendar is the Feast of Tabernacles, or ingathering, which is a celebration of the harvest at the end of the agricultural year. This season also reminds the Jews that God delivered them from Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years living in tents or tabernacles. Jesus came and tabernacled or lived in human flesh. According to Revelation 21, 3, quote, But now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and will be their God, end quote. The prophetic fulfillment of the three fall festivals will culminate with the return of Jesus to the earth. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
So far on our journey, we've explored the prayer shawl and the menorah. So let's continue to the shofar. The shofar is nothing more than the hollow horn of a ram used to produce sound by blowing through its narrow end. The ram's horn itself reminds the Jewish people that God provided a ram to be sacrificed in place of Abraham's son, Isaac. The sound of the shofar in Hebrew is called teshuvah, and it literally means return, and it emphasizes returning to God and recognizing Him as the creator of the world. Just as a bugle can signal various tasks and times to an army, the shofar was used to communicate a variety of messages, such as a call to assembly, a call to war, the ending of a fast, and others. Remember for a moment the story of the Israelites marching around the walls of Jericho. At the appointed time, a blast from the shofar signaled the people to lift up a great shout, and the walls fell. Aish.com says this about the shofar, quote, when the breath of a human being is blown through it, it becomes a living embodiment of the heart and emotion of the human being, crying out to its maker." End quote. So the sound of the shofar brings to the mind of the hearer the divine image he carries, and it calls him to strive to be more like his creator. The most important function of the shofar will be when it signals the return of Jesus to the earth. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Today on our journey, we've explored three biblical symbols, the prayer shawl, the menorah, and the shofar. Each in turn reminds us of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, from the 613 commandments that he faithfully kept, to the menorah with its pattern Jesus' life and ministry, to the blast of the shofar signaling his return. My hope and prayer is that you will be challenged and inspired to learn more about biblical symbols and how they all point to this amazing Jewish man named Jesus. After all, the whole Bible, from Genesis all the way to the maps in the back, it's all about Him. Thank you. So I hope that you really learned a lot. I hope that you'll not just take my word for it, but go and really research this yourself, dig into the Word of God, and learn how these symbols, even in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, how they all point to Him. And I hope that you'll, again, not just take my word for it, but go and find and seek that out for yourself. And thank you for your attention.